at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Um, so first off, um, please kindly turn off your or switch off your turn off your camera, please, and um, mute your mic, please. OK, um, good morning once again. My name is John Mutua. I, I work um, at the Institute of Economic Affairs as a programs coordinator, and I also head the program on public finance uh, management. So I'm very excited to invite you to the to today's, actually this is the 22nd webinar that the Institute of Economic Affairs has held um, um, since towards the end of uh, March, I think. Um, and actually most of the webinars have been about COVID, so effects of COVID on education, on uh, trade, on the economy and the like. Um, so today's uh, forum is uh, We'll be discussing the lower middle income uh, status um, and, and, and what we'll be doing is to look at Kenya's uh, performance. Uh, but before we get started, I would just like to mention that um, Institute of Economic Affairs is a think tank um, and what we do is to promote debate and dialogue on public policy issues. And so, so, so today we, we, we are continuing with a series of, um, of webinars and um, um, as a way of setting the context, uh, we had a webinar that looked at uh, issues of uh, effect of COVID on on the economy. Um, and in that in that uh, webinar, we looked at issues of um, um, how the, of course, economic growth rate has been uh, affected by 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 COVID and some of the policy responses that. The government will need to put in place for a quick for a quick um, quick rebound. So today, um, what will be as a way of context, um, what you would like to note is obviously that um, we've had some global economic uh, shock um, from this uh, pandemic, and this has actually put some brakes on on uh, the long growth phase. That most of the economies in in Africa, in Asia, and actually even in Latin America have been have been enjoying. Um, but uh, just to note that um, economic theory and the em em empirical evidence shows that there is still some space for for growth. Now, um, if you look at the Asian countries, especially China and uh, and India, there is some kind of a convergence. Um, in terms of their income status, uh, which is actually converging towards uh, the European Union uh, countries' uh, income in income levels, and uh, coming back, I mean, closely to 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 Kenya within the East Africa community. Uh, for those who follow the or who follow uh, economic uh, related news, um, we you, you may be aware that Tanzania, our, uh, our neighbours here. Um, um, were actually they actually got into the lower middle income uh, status, and so within East Africa, Tanzania recently joined us, um, and for them actually this came five years before they they are targeted, and we expect that for both Rwanda and Uganda they will be probably joining this uh, uh, status maybe in the next five, or who knows five to seven seven years. Um, so that's basically the context. Um, so without further ado, what I'll do, I will welcome. Uh, so we have two presenters, and this is uh, uh, my colleague. So we have uh, Leo Kemboy, who works in the uh, Constitution, Law and Economics uh, program, who will go first. And thereafter, you will be followed by Kwame Owino, who is our, our, our CEO. So they will let us know what um, they will delve more into the issues of, um, uh, I mean, of course, focusing on Kenya's lo lower middle income status and how we performed as a country, and also just telling us what this means. Uh, what does it mean to 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 be a low or to get into the low? I mean, into the the middle income. What thresholds are used and stuff like that, and also delve more into the issues of um, uh, of, of how we perform because getting into the Middle income status is one thing, but um, 
maintaining that status and actually upgrading to the middle income uh, to the upper uh, status is 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 uh, is another thing altogether okay so without further ado uh, i would like to welcome kemboys and then after there after kemboy seamlessly kemboy will uh, will allow uh, will uh, kwame will actually continue from where kemboy will will live thank you yes <clears throat> thank you john so uh, as John has mentioned, we, could be going to, we are going to discuss to assess Kenya's performance of, uh, over, over a period of time and now see whether, whether we, we are seeing a convergence in the, in the, in, in the economy in, in, the, in the economy or a divergence. So, so I'll come first and then Kwame will explain what what why 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 there's a divergence and why what what is wrong with the economic our our, our economic growth model that we've chosen so just to put into context that by the time we declared a middle income status country in 2014 Kenya had a very had, had a very long uh, from uh, since liberal liberalization and the reason why we've chosen we've analyzed from 1990 is because that is when market liberalization started and the markets actually started working and they so it's to be a good picture to uh, to we saw if it fits that would be a good picture to start from 1990 and assess up to the present time and see when we were declared a middle income status country in 2014 what does it mean for us so if you as you see in the chart trends in kenya's economic growth rate from 1990 to 2020 that our although our, our growth rate has been going up we've had a lot of shocks and you can see from those traps the one in 92 93 1997 2000, 2002, and 2008, and similarly from 2012. Although the those shocks were not were, were much smaller, that but they've ever they've been since 2012 to now the present. As you see from the chart, the indication by the IMF, the World Economic Outlook, that is that we're, this year our economy is going to contract by negative 0 0.3 that is from june's the june update so the picture has not been rosy and it explains it has a it has a lot to do with the way our markets uh, our economy structured uh, our markets uh, the, the the influence of government and so many other things so to make sense of this chart you will go to We'll now look at things that we think th that have contributed to the GDP growth. So this data is from the National Treasury uh, report that was done in 2017. It's Kenya's Comprehensive Public Expenditure Review. So as you see, there are two things that have of very that are very very important in in this chart. So there is the total factor of productivity and the capital. So, so you know, as we all know from, and generally, as economists, we, we know that firms need capital, and they need capital to, to replenish store, to expand, to improve productivity, and, and other things. So, generally, uh, the capital stock over time has not grown significantly. So in terms of the contribution to, to GDP in 92, 1992 to 2017, it contributed, the contribution from capital stock was 2.9, then 1992 to 2002, 1.9, 2003, 2007. So overall, from 1992 to 2017, it was 2.9%. But 
in the pre pre previous periods, 1992, 2002, it was 1.9%. So, and then 2.6. The biggest, the years that the capital, capital stock contributed more to average GDP growth was in 2008, 2012, where it contributed 4%. And then it declined again with to 3.3. So when you see, and this go hand in hand with total factor productivity. Our total factor productivity has been significantly low. The biggest, the where it has been, where it has contributed the most is 2003-2007. And that is, it, contrib it contributed 1.1% to the average GDP growth. And then again, 2008, 2012, it declined, negative 1.1. And then it improved slightly to 0 0.5 in 2013, 2017. So as you see that the, those shocks correlate with, this, with, the, with the two things that we are showing here, total factor produ productivity and capital. And so it's important. So as so in terms of policy, and this is we will dwell further. I know Kwame will dwell further on this issue of productivity and what it means for us as a middle income status country. <clears throat> so this is trends in Kenya's GDP per capita in current terms, 1990 to 2019. So Currently, it's almost about $2,000. $2, but we have marked from 2003 to, 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 20, to, 29, to, the, to the present is, this, this is where we had a, a very huge leap, a big momentum. And as you can see, they, it moved from 300, almost from $380 in a shorter period by 2012 it was above a thousand dollars, twenty and up to now. So it has moved very fast. And this, as you know, from two thousand and three, we had an aggressive, we had aggressive, we we had aggressive changes. We had reforms that aggressively changed the the structure of the economy. Although much had not been done. There were some lapses, like as you can see from 2008 to 2012, it stagnated. But generally, th that is what caused that momentum. So, our generally, for to to put this into perspective, is that what we did. We, for us to to see whether we have had progress or not, we compared ourselves with other economies. So we picked the ESC four countries plus Ethiopia, and added other sel select economies outside the, the continent and inside the continent. So we selected Nigeria, we selected South Africa, we selected Brazil, Malaysia, and then the Ethiopia, Rwanda, Uganda and Burundi. So as you can see, in 2009, the, the GDP per capita in current terms was $589. In 2019, the GDP per capita is $1,817. So it has, it has actually almost grown by it, it, almost four times. However, as you can see from the for, for Malaysia, it doubled from five thousand six hundred and thirty-four dollars to eleven thousand four hundred and fourteen. So, likewise, Brazil has grown also significantly, uh, South Africa, and so. But as you can see, also from the Ethiopia, which had grown, which had, has had the fastest growth rates in the world over a very long period of time, since early 2000. When it, in 2009, it has $192. In, in 2019, it had $858. In 
So although the growth rate had been there, it has not been significant enough to push Ethiopia past the $1,000 mark. So likewise, as you can see, the biggest, the, 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 second, the second most biggest economy in ESC, Tanzania, at $503, and it, or it went up, it, dub, it doubled to $1,922. As John had also had mentioned, that Tanzania joined us in the middle income status beginning as, uh, as uh, this year, and it shows convergence. So the same thing with, you ex expect Rwanda, they, all the countries in the ESA, with, the, with the exception of uh, South Sudan and Burundi, to, co to join us in almost seven or nine years, depending on how things unfold. So, as I had mentioned, we compared. So, this is uh, this chart compares Kenya in PPP terms, in PPP, as a share of the ESC countries plus Ethiopia from 1990 to 2019. And, and in 19, so first things first, so Burundi is an outlier because in, for, it has continued to the, 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 the income difference in between uh, and, uh, Kenya and Burundi in P income per capita in PPP terms as actually widened further. So uh, while at the same time, the rest of the countries, Uganda and Rwanda, it's almost 195% uh, in 2019. So the country that has met, that is has significantly grown is Tanzania. So it's under uh, Kenya, a person, a, a Kenyans, an, a, an a Kenyan, uh, on an average, is uh, incomes is 163 percent of what a Tanzanian would be. So for Rwanda and Burundi, uh, for Rwanda, uh, for Rwanda, uh, for Burundi, it's five, almost six times. Kenyans' income is all by, by, by year in PPP terms is almost six times as as and, and, and as those uh, as a Burundian. So comparative again, if you see for Rwanda and for for Rwanda and Uganda, it's the the at Kenya, it, the income per capita is as twice as much as the ones in Burundi. So we also the select African economy. So we compared Kenya's incomes in, GG, in, in we also compared Kenya, Kenya's income in PPP terms together with Nigeria and Sub South Africa and, and also the Sub-Saharan average. So, as you note from the, in 1990, um, the income, the, the Nigeria, Nigeria is the one in orange, or the orange guard color. So, so in 1990, it was 72%. Kenya's, uh, Kenya's income per capita was uh, income per capita per person was 72%. But the, so Nigeria in in 20 in 2019, it's 84%. So Nigeria is also catching up. In for South Africa, in 1990, it was 87. For it was 23%. In, income per capita per person. In, in 2019, it's 35%. Also, they are catching, they, 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 they are catching up. The growth, they, they have had, they have had a, grow, a very fast growth rate than, than us. So, the sub-Saharan, the overall sub-Saharan average, in 1990, income per person for the sub-Saharan average was for, of Kenyan per person was 87%. In 2019, it's 115%. All the three charts show the same trend, as you can see here from 2002 to 2014, it had slumped. And likewise, the same, 
the same shows for South Africa, the same shows for Nigeria, and the same shows for for sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see that the, the the implication is that the major explanation that I can give for this chart is the the size of Nigeria and South African economies is is a big that it affects it pulls the sub-Saharan average, and also the same trend affected us by almost the same trend, the same issues within within these economies. So we also compared Kenya's incomes in PPP terms as a share of select economies for those uh, for those that are outside Africa. So we used Malaysia, uh, India, Brazil, and United Kingdom. So the upper one, the this the the, the, the upper one, they shows that for India, it was the income per capita in PPP terms was 100 and to, for for Kenya they are 123 percent per person. But however, since the liberalisation took place, they have had a very fast growth rate, and as of 2019, it was 64 percent. So and you can see the trend. So if you also compare for the Brazil. In 1990, it was 22%. In 2019, it was 30%. For the UK, it's 9% up to the same. So up to 50, it was 15% in 2019. So the UK, it has always remained the same. It means that for they have had and and much we have never matched them in the economic growth rate enough. For, we have never caught up with them, so and that's why it has remained constant over that long period of time. For Malaysia, which is the blue line, 22% in 1990, they have also it, they have also caught, the, the the difference has also come down to 15%. So all these countries, what it shows is that these economies outside uh, outside Africa, so Malaysia, India and the UK and Brazil have all had faster economic growth rates than, than, than us. So now, so another thing to explain progress is the government expenditure on education. So generally, this, this affects these are major factors that affects productivity because if you are able to develop your human the human capital, it shows in labor productivity, which ultimately shows in other forms of productivity, technology, and the rest. So we compared now periods of times, and these are averages. So we have two two periods of time: 2000 to 2009, 2010 to 2019. In 2000, Kenya, in 2000-2009 period, Kenya was the leading among the countries, the select countries we compared with. Kenya invested 6.3% as a share of GDP on education. However, in 20, as you can see, it dropped to fourth in 2010-2019. So, um, South Africa, which was third, in the first period with 5.1% is now the leading with 6% as a share of GDP. And also uh, Malaysia, which was 5.9%, has actually dropped to 5.1%. And al although these are bigger economies and of course quantums involved are huge. So the, within the India, which was 10th, 3.5% as a share of GDP, has also improved to 3.7. So, for the rest of East African countries, Rwanda was 4.3 in the first period, 4.1 in the second period. And Brazil, 4.5, now 5.9. Although, the reason why it's important to that the, the expenditure on education remains high is that one of the things that 
we've noted as uh, is that there's a concept in economics called complexity, which is most other people call it ubiquity, which is a society, a society's knowledge is seen in the products they they manufacture, they produce. So it shows from the expenditure on education, you can see it from the attainment gap, the, the achievement gap, the attrition rates, those things. And Kwame will explain further on this and why it's, it's a very, very important, what, why it's a very, very important and the biggest policy issue that Kenya should pursue. You should, you should know that during that period, 2000 to 2009, that we compared with the first period, is this is the period where Kenya was rolling out the free primary education. And based on now, it's almost universal. And some of the things that you can see, if you look at the African Economic Outlook report for 2020, the, for 2020, so what they did in the, the education chapter was 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 a very big chapter in that the African economic the the FDP African Economic Outlook report, and they compared the scores for Kenyans in for Kenyans and those or the the attainment scores for Kenyans in the middle and and those with countries in upper and middle income countries like Colombia. So some of the things that they, in, the, in the report that they highlighted is that a performance here on average is almost at the same level on, as those in, 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 in those upper and middle income countries. So you can see that the, what's that investment in 2000, 2000, from 2000, 2009 that went up paid off actually. Now next is to see another issue that measures, to measure progress is to compare now the Gini coefficient. As you all know, the Gini coefficient compare is actually a, a, a measurement of income inequality. So in the two periods, so in the first period, 2000 to 2009, Kenya had a Gini index of 46.5. It, it improved to 40.8 relative to these other countries. So um, India has also made uh, the, so has also made progress from 37.1 to 37.8. As you can see, the most unequal, the, the most unequal in our group that we select, the select economies we compared with, is South Africa. So, and as you all know that South Africa, there is the most resource intensive countries are the ones that have an, more income inequality. Uh, Brazil still remains the same thing, 56, it's, although it's, it's 50 to 53. South Africa has actually increased. It should be important, it's important to know that. Uh, interestingly, uh, Rwanda, among the ESE, Economies. Rwanda is the most unequal uh, compared to the rest of ESC economies. So it's 50.2. It was 50.2 in the first period, 2000 to 2009, and now 45.3 to 2010, 2019. So Ethiopia is the most unequal, unequal, uh, unequal. Uh, is the most of this. The most. The most. Ethiopia is the most. The, the one that shows the least in quality. So 29.8 to 34, it, although it, it, the inequality, inequality has increased to 34.1. One of the things, as I had shown you, is in the first chart on the GDP per capita, is that Ethiopia in the first period, 2000 to 2009, had an, in the GDP, the, an average of almost 158 dollars so what the, for for them the incomes are low as the ethiopian the incomes per capita continue to grow in ethiopia that inequality will still continue to to broaden so just not to them data and data new they 
the reason why I've put up this is to show the progress. That although this select number of countries has improved on inequality, with the exception of South Africa, there, they have not no significant no significant pro no significant progress has been made to cut inequality let's say by more than 40 40 50% so so for these countries and that's why it's important it's it's a very important measure of progress now this chart so we one one of the things to show to show an, an whether welfare is improving or not is to compare the price level ratio of PPP conversion factor GDP to market exchange rate. Uh, this index actually it compares the bundle of goods relative relative to the to, to, to the US to the to, to a common currency that can be bought across all these countries. So as you can see in the first period 2000-2009 Kenya had 0.33 However, in the second period, 2010-2019, it has it, it it downgraded to 0.41. So the smaller the smaller the ratio, the more the more the more affordable the, the more the, the, the as you go down, the, the more worse it goes. So South Africa, 0.46 to it it also it wasn't off to 0.53. Brazil 0.46 to 0.71. Um, so, overall, all throughout this, all this period, is the this is this this impact this has impacted the the cost of living um, negatively. So, so over time to show that what has happened is either the it could be either the markets are not working working properly. The in, it also could also mean in, it could also also mean from the income inequality and the rest. So now, as I end my presentation there, and I ask now Kwame to, to proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Leo. Um, uh, thanks, Leo. This is Kwame. Thank you very much for laying this. But just before I finish up uh, quickly, uh, I'll ask you to take us back to chart 10 and 9 so that I can explain something because it's important for us to explain what divergence it is we are, we are referring to. Uh, mm -hmm. So chart, yes, so this is chart 10. Now, remember, um, what, what we are trying to explain is to ask ourselves, Kenya is a middle-income country. And middle income status suggests, lower middle income status suggests that there's been income growth relative to the past. So what we are asking ourselves is, apart from just measuring what the nominal income growth is, it's important to ask ourselves or to try to answer the question, what does it mean relative to other people uh, in terms of per person? So what we are measuring here is taking Kenya's income, uh, uh, or rather the per capita income every year, uh, and asking ourselves, uh, how does it compare to Nigeria? So here we have Nigeria, we have, uh, or rather Kenya, South Africa, and we have Kenya, Sub-Saharan African average, and Kenya and Nigeria. Now what these three charts, what these three curves tell you, or rather what these three lines tell you, is that in 1990, because uh, we've taken about a 28 to 30 year survey, in 1990, uh, on the gray line, which is Kenya compared to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya's income relative to Sub-Saharan African average was 87%, showing you that Kenyans were earning 87% for every 100 shillings that a Sub-Saharan African earned, which means Kenya's average income in 1990 was below Sub-Saharan African average because it would have to get to 100 to match it. So basically, that's what this index does. I need to re-emphasize it because Kemboi rushed through it quite a bit. Now, what that tells you is that over the 30 years or 28, 29 years, between 1990 to 2007, Kenya came from being a laggard in the sense that it was below sub-Saharan African average to 115%. So it's telling you that on the average in 2018, 2019, an average income 
in Kenya on a purchasing power parity basis was 15% above what the sub-Saharan African average is. I think that's a significant, a very, very important point to take home. On the other hand, with respect to Nigeria, it's telling you that Kenyans in 1990 earned 72% equivalent of what a Nigerian earned, which means Kenyan average incomes were below Nigerians by 28%. And that's been, there's been some growth over time. And by 2018, 2019, uh, Kenyans were still below Nigerians, but earning 84% equivalent. So for every $100 that a Nigerian took home in 2019, the Kenyan took home 84. That's how to measure this. The third area is with Malaysia. I mean, with the, sorry, with the South, South Africa. Again, here we need to be careful. I think uh, Kemboy twisted it the other way. What it's telling you is in 1990, the average income of a Kenyan relative to South Africa on purchasing power parity terms was only 23%. So it means that for every $100 that a South African earned in 1990, notwithstanding the existence of apartheid, Kenyan income was 23%. And this has grown over time, sometimes falling below in 2004, 2005, 2006. But when it gets to last year, 2019, it was 35%. So for every 100 shillings, that an, $100 that a South African earns on a purchasing power parity basis, a Kenyan is earning $35 as much. So Kenyan income over the 30 years has been catching up with, with South Africans. It's been catching up with Nigerians, but it has actually gone above the sub-Saharan African average. I think that's a... It, it, a very important point to 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 consider. Uh, so that's that's basically uh, one. Now, point. Uh, let's go to slide ten. So slide ten here again. So remember, relative to Africa, Kenyan incomes have been catching up with the other bigger economies, but with respect to 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 sub-Saharan Africa, at the end of last year, Kenyan incomes were fifteen percent higher than the sub-Saharan African average. Let's now look at the, sub -sub the, 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 the other countries in the world. Now here, so here is Kenyan incomes as a share of select economies outside Africa. And what we are seeing here is basically uh, two things. So there's blue, which is Kenya, comparing Kenya to, to Malaysia, which is a blue one. So what it's telling you is in 1990, Kenyans earned 22% of what Malaysians earned. It's actually gone down. So relative to Malaysia, Kenyans are actually poorer in terms of their affordability to afford things. It's gone from 22% to 15%. So when you hear Kenyan uh, leaders anchoring and saying, look, we are comparing to Malaysia and everything, we are actually, Kenyans are actually falling behind based on an income as a measure. Uh, with equivalent to the UK, partly because, of course, the UK, we have a colonial history, and it's telling you that over 30 years, Kenyans, in terms of income, have not gained on the UK. It's basically flat. So there's no convergence that's taking place with respect to the UK, telling you that UK incomes are growing at a much, at an individual level, are growing at a much faster rate than the average Kenyan income on purchasing power parity, because purchasing power parity is one way to correct for differences in incomes between people. Um, now, for Brazil, which is the orange line, you can tell that for Brazil in the orange line, it's 22% at the beginning of 1990, and it's gotten to 30%, which means that Kenya has actually caught up, or rather is catching up 8 percentage points over 28 years slow, but on the whole, it's much, much better in the sense that for every $100 earned by a Brazilian in 1990, Kenyans earned 22, for the equivalent now, Kenyans earn 30. So you've gained 8 percentage points over a period of 28 years. Now, what this tells you, obviously, is that there is no, um, this is why we call it a divergence. So basically, for many of the countries that we think Kenya should be benchmarked against, whether it's, uh, if you take away uh, the UK, uh, with, with respect to South Africa, there's some catching up. Obviously, South Africa has had a, a difficult four or five years behind. But on the whole, with the, Kenya, the countries that Kenya thinks that it should be benchmarked against, obviously, there's been um, um, a divergence. So with those two charts, let's now go down to why we think there's a divergence. So this is where we talk about divergence. Um, so we go to chart 14. Let's go to the first. Now, we've split the explanations. And remember, what we wanted to do was just to present the charts and then ask ourselves by thinking about it from an economics point of view, what has happened. And the first thing that you know when incomes... Economists know that the major driver of sustained income growth is productivity. Now, productivity is, 
economists speak for how much input, how much output you get for every unit of input. So if it is labor, how efficient is a laborer today in terms of what they provide to a farm so that you can measure the increase in output based on the increased, I mean, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the input, which is labor, or whether it's capital and everything else. So all those goods, and as Leo showed you in one of those charts, I think it was in chart four, Kenya's factor productivity by each of those, whether it's capital, whether it's labor, and the combined effect has actually been low, even negative. In fact, the World Bank report shows that Kenya's total productivity actually peaked in 1980, and since then it has not reached those levels. So what that's telling you is that even if we are having income growth, we are not having income growth because the economy is becoming more efficient. We are having income growth because we are pushing more people into the labor market. Even if your average person getting into the labor market is not as productive as they were, but because you have bigger numbers, that's what is leading. So basically, it's a question of volume as opposed to the quality of that. Now, so we split it into domestic and the other is uh, external. So we'll start with the domestic factors. The domestic factors is the basically efficiency of the government of Kenya. In the 30 years that we've talked about government of Kenya's budgets, in nominal terms have increased by close to 10 times, nominal, without, uh, over that 30 years. Um, now, what we need to ask ourselves is what is the size, what's the efficiency of government spending, how does it redistribute, and what are the policies and what is government funding? Because government has more money based on the fact that the, the economy has grown, and we, we suspect that obviously government efficiency in terms of spending, because government spends close to 25, 26, 27% of GDP every year, obviously that's a huge amount. And what, we, what the total efficiency of the public sector is actually falling or completely negative. And then obviously on the openness of the economy, on the other hand, has also been um, a question. So the domestic factors are first, efficiency at government level. The second is, is Kenyan economy has not been sufficiently open. And even if it has been open, there are many, many farms, um, and we have market problems. There are many, many farms in Kenya that exist, but they have been very, very inefficient and inefficient for a very long time. So for instance, uh, the third point is basically structural transformation. So we'll go, and our view is that structural transformation is the most significant, and we'll be illustrating with a couple of charts. Uh, in the coming place. So this is, these are the four factors that explain the domestic fa side, which is efficiency of government, the openness of the economy overall, market problems, which is basically the efficiency within specific markets and structural transformation, which is the ability to change the economy um, or to change labor from agriculture to more productive sectors such as manufacturing and overall to services. Uh, next slide. Uh, so if you look at Kenya's manufacturing, which illustrates the question of, 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 of structural transformation, one of the first things that you see is that the, the share of manufacturing contribution to GDP from 2014, this is for, uh, over a five-year horizon, has been shrinking from 9.96% to 7.74% of the economy. Now, in terms of nominal value, it has not necessarily shrunk, but it's telling you that what is happening? Manufacturing, which is a higher productivity sector than agriculture, um, or some small-scale agriculture, or some agriculture, is actually shrinking, telling you that overall, the way the Kenyan economy is combining factors, labor, capital, uh, and, 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 and machinery, is actually getting less efficient. Um, and so you see that decline. That decline in itself should concern us, because it suggests that overall efficiency within the Kenyan economy is going poor, is, is, is getting poorer. Even if incomes are growing, as I said, it is income that is growing by perspiration in the sense that we are putting more people into the labor market. If we say eight, nine hundred thousand, I mean, six, seven hundred thousand people leave high school every year and come to the labor market, obviously they're coming to labor market with different levels of preparation. Um, but if the total factors are not used efficiently, what it means is you're just adding more people. And it's creating growth, yes, but it's growth on an average level that is much, much lower. And that's how come we are not matching up and that divergence with, uh, with the peers such as Malaysia is very, very evident. Next slide. Next slide, Leo. Okay, now, one other thing that we think explains that is Leo already showed that Kenya does not have a problem in terms of investment in what we call human capital or as I'd call it education. So if you saw it, Kenya is among the highest. Kenya actually spends much higher than India, even China and um, South Africa, uh, with the exception, of course, of the last three years. Kenya has always spent six to seven percent, close to 6.3% of GDP on education every year. 
It's fallen now to 5.6, as, as, as Leo showed. But even then, um, we should ask ourselves, it's, it's not just spending, we should ask ourselves, what are we buying? So we have a figure here coming from a, um, a, a study conducted by, by the World Bank in uh, 2018, at the end of 2018, uh, and it's called Facing Schooling for Learning in Africa. And we want to show if the biggest thing Kenya buys is education, 5.8% of GDP, 6% of GDP, much, much higher than many even developing countries, what does that mean? And what we've taken as a proxy to show you what the quality of education is or just what, what, what might be going wrong is, if you look at the red chart right at the top of the, of the, of the, of the page where Kenya is, uh, at grade seven, Kenya has 100% survival rates in terms of the number of children who are going from one class to the other. So if you see from grade one to grade 10, to grade nine, eight, seven, it's about 100. By grade eight, it's close to 90. But it falls to 80% in grade nine, which would basically be where people, where the children trans, um, make the transition from primary to secondary school. So, for instance, we measured this one last year. The difference between the number of children who start KCPE at grade eight and those who go into form one at grade nine, which is which is supposed to 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 transmit and ensure that you're having higher value labor, quality labor. 300,000 children out of the 1.5, 1.4, who sat uh, KCP did not go. And that's a huge loss because it's telling you that that difference um, and that inefficiency, which leads to that number of people dropping out, tells you that they'll form lower quality labor even into the future, irrespective of what their cognitive capabilities are. So part of that is basically how Kenya is not ensuring that the entire chain of education right from grade one all the way to at least grade 12 is, um, is, 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 is transmitted enough. So we have a lot of sunk cost right up to uh, grade eight, and then the sharp fall. And that sharp fall means that even for the Democratic Republic of Congo, 83% of children who go in manage to actually go from grade eight into the low, uh, higher grades, but for Kenya, it's only 80. So Kenya tends to have extreme inefficiency in ensuring the transmission because the attrition rates are too high. Uh, Ghana is at 90%, uh, Nigeria is 83, Senegal is 82. So obviously, uh, that big gap for Kenya is one that's a bit of a problem. And remember, Kenya is actually leading all the way to grade eight because it's a it's a national. I mean, it's a standard for all 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 these countries. The dropouts, but at the attrition rate at standard eight is too much, and that affects the quality of labor. And that quality of labor tells you something about the labor productivity that must be expected once people go into the market. Uh, I'll go much faster now, and then we go to 18. Next slide. Now, here we are talking about, remember some of those people who actually go into high school are the ones who will be showing up to, into manufacturing enterprises because the labor quality has to show up in the, in the market itself. And you can tell Kenya's manufacturing contribution to total employment, obviously, not a big amount, but it's falling. But if you're talking about a, a labor force that has 10 million people, a fall of between 12% to 11% tells you that an extra 1 million people um, could have found jobs, but are not. But what this is telling you is that other sectors are probably absorbing this labor, and there are sectors where the labor productivity is probably lower than what you would find in employment and I mean, in manufacturing employment. Uh, so let's go now to the external factors. Uh, so the external factors, next slide. So the external factors, we will just posit two of them. One of them is international trade, Kenya's trade exposure, international or global trade, and the second one is basically the ability of Kenyan farms to go into global value chains. And I'll explain them in two, two, two ways. So next slide. Now, if you go to the next, in our next slide here, we are showing two pictures in 2011 and 2019. So the 2011 tells you what the share of trade to GDP gross domestic product is for a certain level of countries that we've chosen. And if you look at it, Malaysia, a small country, uh, about, uh, uh, closely closer to 28 million people in population. Uh, Kenya, trade to GDP in Malaysia was 154%, almost 155. Kenya's was 60%. By 2019, it had reduced for that Malaysia as well to 123%. In Kenya's case, it was half at 33%. So basically, it's telling you that Kenya's exposure to global trade is actually reducing over this nine year period. Remember, at that same time as, as, as Malaysia's trade to GDP in, uh, uh, maintained uh, from 154 to 123, the income gap between Kenyans and 
uh, Malaysians actually spread down, I mean, uh, increased by another eight percentage points, uh, telling you that obviously Malaysia is getting a few things right, many more things right than we are, and especially on the side of, 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 of expanding its trade exposure. Part of the reason participation in global trade is not possible uh, might be some decisions that Kenya has made regarding the ability to export, but also more importantly, trying to rely on domestic enterprises and, 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 and that. I'll give an example here. Uh, a couple of days back, actually about a week ago, uh, Kenyans were arguing, or oh, let me say, COVID-19 has, 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 has introduced a different debate in public affairs in Kenya. One of those is that Kenyans are increasingly saying that reliance on domestic uh, production of goods, import substitution is a good thing. Um, and part of the reason is so that we can capture local markets and prevent Kenyans from export, I mean, importing things from, from outside. Our suspicion is that might be the wrong call, given two things. One, uh, we cite a study from the World Bank which suggests that Kenyan manufacturing firms um, are not sufficiently embedded into global value chains. So that's the first one. But also more importantly, that Kenyan manufacturing farms that actually produce for domestic consumption are very inefficient and it's not difficult to see. Some of the largest manufacturing farms, the sugar industry is Kenya's largest manufacturing sector, agricultural manufacturing sector. Uh, and if you can see what, what happens is completely inefficient sugar farms. Um, they cannot export anywhere, but for some reason, because of distortions and government decisions, they are protected. And government has decided once again to reinvest in them. So they are trapping a lot of capital in inefficient farms and not raising productivity. So sugar productivity, sugarcane sector productivity in Kenya is one of the lowest in the world. We can blame imported sugar, we can blame dumping of sugar, but the truth is your productivity, our productivity numbers tell us that sugar, sugarcane production in Kenya is extremely expensive, inefficient, and is not going to be competitive in a very uh, uh, close while. And why does it continue to survive? It continues to survive because of the distortions that government creates through uh, tariffs protecting those countries. So basically that reflects in some of these things. And the point is this, if that money or if those resources were reallocated to other sectors that are more efficient, productivity in Kenya would rise and that would assure us that Kenyan incomes would continue to grow up and actually close out those divergence gaps. We will not close those divergence gaps if we continue, if Kenya will not close those divergence gaps if there's an insistence that those sugar factories, as they exist today, continue to survive. Because what that means is we'll be using resources more inefficiently. And every six, seven years, government will have to subsidize these farms, which means there'll be a lot of resources wastage. And what that means is that the total efficiency of the Kenyan economy, even from that sectoral level, will continue to lag behind. So that's basically uh, some of the lessons that it's telling us. Now, let's go to the point of global value chains. Next up. Now, why global value chains? The global value chains, manufacturing sectors, and we think that Kenya's manufacturing is one of the biggest. The, the, the study we cite at the, thought, at the bottom here, which is a World Bank study, as I told you about it, uh, is the, a World Bank study did a farm level productivity diagnostic for Kenya's manufacturing and services sector and found out that actually Kenya's, it surprised me, Kenya's services sector, while it is diverse, actually is more efficient in terms of productivity than manufacturing. Now, not only is Kenya's manufacturing sector um, um, less productive, I mean, less, has lower productivity measures, but that there's greater dispersion. So the best farms in Kenya could actually compete globally and export. The worst farms in Kenya are only in Kenya because they can survive because of distortion. So as I say, government protection or the insistence that these farms survive. And while that is true, the worst part is that the less inefficient farms in Kenya actually charge higher prices, which means they make it that affordability index. They make it less affordable for people to buy many more things because they have to be supported out of that inefficiency. So what we are claiming here is a worse functioning and more distorted markets in Kenya's manufacturing sector, suggesting that obviously it's a big drug and that might suggest why it's, an, it's unable to create efficient jobs because as you saw, that gap polling, it means that it's not creating jobs because inefficient farms would be unable to actually create many jobs. They're less, um, uh, they're less efficient to begin with. So obviously they absorb many more, um, they use resources less efficiently than they are competing, that the competition would, would, would use that. So it's telling us here that all those diagnostics that we've seen and the, pick, the, 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 the fact that Kenya is only catching up in Africa, 
is telling you that we are competing, that Kenya within Africa might have a few farms that are doing well, but on the whole, compared to the rest of the globe, the catching up is actually not happening as uh, the story says. So even if Kenya is a lower middle income uh, country, the threshold is so low that actually just getting to a lower middle income country alone does not tell you something about the overall efficiency of Kenya's, um, of, of, of Kenya's economy. So uh, if you remember two days ago, uh, the president identified a couple of Kenyan um, uh, uh, carpenters who should be in the manufacturing business. And many of them can construct uh, copies of hospital beds, which um, the president asked for them to be allowed to, 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 to send to the Kenyan, to the Kenyan um, I mean, through to Kenyan public hospitals. Now, Kenyans debated a, a few other things that are not the subject of our discussion today, whether it was favoritism for one farm or the other is a different matter, and whether it, uh, it, uh, it was a violation of procurement law. But what concerned us is, Leo and I took those beds and we went to a global market and benchmark. Now, those average of those beds, based on what the press reported was that one was being sold for 48,000 shillings and another one was for 63,000 shillings or 59,000 shillings for hospital beds that are basically manual. We went to Amazon and we went to a global marketplace in Alibaba and we found out that you can find those beds from China for between 5,000 shillings to 12,000. Telling you that the president of Kenya is a making an approval or Kenyans are pressurizing the president to approve the purchase of something that looks like a hospital bed which has not been globally certified for five times the rate at which you can find it from China. Unbelievable. Now, that, what that tells you is how we create distortions and entrench inefficiency. So fine, Kenyan, Kenyan, Kenyan carpenters must get jobs. But basically, because we are buying things from the public sector, it's interesting that we are prepared in the name of buying Kenyan to actually get a manufacturer or a, a carpenter who's building a bed at five times the global price. At that rate, obviously, what we're doing is crowding in inefficiency. What should happen instead is these people should be asked if they cannot match the prices on a small premium, buying goods at five times what it costs cannot be the basis of economic and sustained economic growth. So that tells you why Kenya's manufacturing sector is as it is. So the first point. The second point is, I would think that because we also have a huge sector in Kenya of, 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 of private sector firms running health services, if these people are not able to buy to a private sector firm, sell to a private sector firm, it tells you that the Kenyan public sector is stuck with buying inefficient, buying inefficiency or buying expensive goods and therefore affecting the total factor productivity. And no wonder Kenya's total factor productivity at the public sector level is where it is. You're buying goods that cannot compete globally, and it only means that you can only sell to the Kenyan government and you cannot use mass and sell it outside the borders. Secondly, if there was a manager in Kenya running a hospital and the hospital services are already expensive in Kenya, if they buy Kenyan goods, it means at the point of starting with charging for a bed, they are already running five times the cost. And therefore, our overall costs in terms of consumption of hospital services would be expensive. Uh, so people might have their view, different views about whether President Kenyatta is showing favoritism, but the economics alone suggests that that decision is a bad decision, irrespective of who it favors or whether a different decision it is. Those beds should not be procured, at least for the rates at which they are, in addition to the fact that they need to be certified as to whether they meet international global standards, because that's how growth takes place. It is not sustainable to buy things at five times their competitor's price and expect that an economy would become efficient. Uh, next slide. So as I close, what are our conclusions? I think one of them is growth without productivity is unsustainable, and that's why Kenya is not catching up, because if our total factor productivity is, is lower than others, obviously it means we are not catching up with other countries. But more importantly, it's not just catching up, because the catching up language can also look unnecessarily competitive. We are not making Kenyan lives better if uh, productivity is not increasing. Labor productivity is the way and productivity in total factors is the way in which you can sustain growth and also sustain uh, lifetime. We have to improve the efficiency of government spending. I've illustrated that through those beds. Our education system is such that we need to close both the achievement gap and reduce high school attrition. Uh, because compared to Kenya's peers, again, the problem is not how much Kenya is spending on education. The problem seems to be 
how efficiently those resources are used. And the final one is competition policy. I've spoken about the World Bank study, which showed the inefficiencies in farms in Kenya. And one of the things it's showing is that the best farms in Kenya can actually export globally in manufacturing, but some farms that are so inefficient are absorbing a lot of capital and resources, but they'd actually be better off if they were taken over or even closed because the total efficiency of the economy would improve if those farms did. So we need to allow more aggressive competition policy to work, both in the state parastatals, whether it's the sugar farms, whether it's all those other farms out there, but also in the private sector, because it seems as if we are Kenya is trapped in an equilibrium in which even non-competitive farms are actually able to make money and survive for very, very long. So they survive for very long, they endure, but at the same time, they're inefficient and only rely on high prices and protectionism in Kenya. Thank you very much. John, so you can... Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Kwame and, uh, and Kemboi, for those uh, insights. Um, um, actually, I will not even try to summarize, but, but basically, from, from what Kemboi and Kwame has, have presented, um, looking at uh, our progress, um, in part, this answers questions like, uh, um, I mean, what Kenyans have been discussing in the, in the I think, that gained traction actually in the last uh, in the last one year about uh, growth without um, growth without jobs. Uh, so you can already see uh, they've tried to uh, point us to some of the things that um, that actually answer to that question of why is it that we're experiencing some growth but there are no there are no uh, jobs and uh, and and um, uh, it actually touched on on issues uh, to do with um, actually the main one is the the issue of a structural um, transformation. The fact that agricultural contribution to GDP has been going up, we tend to celebrate that. Uh, whereas what we should be celebrating is actually uh, increase in our uh, contribution of the manufa manufacturing sector to uh, to GDP. Okay, um, so. What I will do, uh, we'll just go straight to a uh, plenary discussion and I can already see from the chat box there are a number of questions that have been posed. So um, I will just read them as they are. But if anyone wants to um, ask a question, uh, please feel free to just unmute your, your mic and uh, or even raise your hand. There's a raise. There's an icon there for raising your hand, um, or you just unmute yourself and you can pose your, your question. Otherwise, let me let me just read the questions as they are. From uh, Alan Oginga. So, Oginga's question is uh, that you like to uh, what is noted is that they need to indicate the sources. So maybe Kwame and uh, Kwame and Kembo, you can mention what the sources for these different uh, statistics that you've shared with us are. I think you mentioned some of them as you were presenting. Um, but you can do that as you also point us to the specific uh, graphs and and and, and uh, tables. Then from from Anderson. Uh, and so Kwame and Kembo, you can just pick this, whatever question is comfortable with you to, to respond to. Um, so from Anderson, does that mean the change in Kenya's PPP per capita uh, compared to Brazil over the years is most likely uh, explained by price level PPP conversion? Um, the reverse effect with India. I guess maybe you can explain that uh, the question is not very clear, um, uh, and I know Kwame tried to explain this some more. Uh, but basically, what Anderson is is, uh, I guess, what he's saying is that maybe you can take us back to that that table on um, the comparison of our income levels to the various countries that we we like to benchmark ourselves to, uh, and in this case, Brazil and uh, India. Then from 
Alan again. So what Alan is saying is that uh, So he's, he's, he's talking about data from uh, informal sector, especially the agricultural sector. Um, how likely is it that the informal sector really adequately covered is covered in the calculations of income to GDP per capita? Uh, yeah. So the contribution of of uh, of the informal sector in in, calcula in calculation of income per capita. So. Either Kwame or Kemboi can can uh, weigh weigh in on that. So what what Alan is 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 also alluding to is whether this um, whether there is a case for underreporting, um, uh, given that uh, this data may or may not be available, and whether it's actually sufficiently covered or include uh, factored in the in the computation of income per capita. Then again from Alan. Uh, to which sector is the manufacturing is manufacturing losing out to? Um, if losing out to say is it losing out to, for instance, the digital economy, then maybe okay. Uh, so he's also alluding to that aspect of comparison between um, manufacturing sector to, of course, agriculture and and um, uh, services service uh, sector so again the two of you can uh, can respond to that and then i guess this would be the last one for this round then let's see from uh, from anderson uh what explains the significant decline in trade uh, so this is to kwame in uh, so this is uh, one of the factors that Kwame you mentioned explaining uh, external, uh, explaining diversion. Yeah? Um, so what explains significant decline in trade as a percentage of GDP in your slide 20 and what's the share of trade within East Africa given the point of inefficiency among farms producing for domestic con consumption? Uh, ESC would be not significantly different here. Yeah. The last part is not very clear, so uh, let's let's. Uh, I think we can. Uh, Kwame and uh, Leo Kemboi, you can respond to those questions first, and then we'll have another another round. Okay, so um, I think Leo should go first, and I'll take the other questions. Yes. So first on the data sources, oh, the all the data comes from the World Development index and you know it's compiled by the world bank so secondly on the question of so yes so that's now back to you kwame I, hello kwame okay can you hear me yeah, yeah, yeah. Please proceed. Okay, proceed. okay, so let's start with this chart on um, on, um, on, on on chapter ten. I mean, on, on on slide ten. Now, the country at the top in yellow is actually India, and what this is telling us is that uh, uh, in 1990, uh, Kenya's Kenya's income per capita as a share of India's was 123 percent. In other words, Kenyans had a higher income level on a purchasing power parity basis than India. And, 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 and this brings us back to the to trade question because trade liberalization was one of the things that India did from 1994 and you see it begins to fall. What that means is if this chart is falling, it means that Kenya is gaining, or that, that, that the country we are comparing against is gaining, uh, is catching up with Kenya. And so what that means is that by 2018, towards 2019, the average Kenyan income was 64%. Uh, that of India, when in the reverse, in 1990, it was a reverse. So basically, uh, India has chopped it out by, by more than a third, I mean, by more than a half, by close to half. And part of what explains that is increased liberalization in India, 
part of it might have been pressure from, uh, from obviously Chinese liberalization and India wanted to also do that. So obviously India opened up because as you saw, as, 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 as we all know, India still has quite some catching up with China to do. But nevertheless, what this is partly um, a story of liberalization and increased competition within the economy. So the, the economy became more vibrant. Um, uh, so you can tell that the one country that actually gained against Kenya was basically uh, India. Uh, on the other hand, Brazil uh, was the one that went the other way. And part of Brazil's question might have been actually that uh, Brazil had a lot of ups and downs, and Brazil, just like Kenya, is never able to maintain uh, policy reforms and maintain them for the long term. So what happens in Brazil is that reforms tend to come, like it will do now, under pressure because the economy is doing poorly, and then the government does not commit to them full time. And what happens is that you have Brazil, the same question as Kenya, Brazilian banks are as efficient as Citibank is in New York. Uh, Brazilian agriculture, not as much. Uh, some manufacturing farms, as, such as Embraer, which even sells aeroplanes to the Kenya Airways, competitive because they're exposed to international competition. The domestic ones, remember Brazil has a huge population, so obviously agriculture in Brazil is huge. Those who export can export. But partly, they also have a captive market domestically, which, which can allow for some inefficiencies to take place in addition to strong lobbies to actually um, instigate, uh, I mean, to advocate for, for competition. So that's the first uh, question. Now, the other question was about uh, what explains the significant decline in trade as a share of GDP. My view is that trade to GDP is not necessarily that it, it decreased because the volume of Kenya's trade is, it actually just shows that overall, uh, other economic growth and overall trade globally grew much faster and Kenya wasn't capturing that. So the countries that captured it, obviously, China. Uh, remember that China simply joined the WTO, I think, in 2005. So obviously, uh, it's made a lot of gains from, uh, I mean, in 2000, and it's made a lot of gains from WTO membership than other countries have exploited. So basically, it might be that. Now, in the ESC as well, yes, Kenya's 50% of Kenya's trade actually is with Uganda and the ESC countries. But you know that they tend to be ESC countries are actually the, the destinations for Kenya's manufacturing exports mostly. And uh, with a with a increased trade, obviously, and a reduction of tariffs, um, there's competition from, from the ESC as well, but also competition from China into the ESC. So obviously the imperative for Kenyan manufacturing to get more competitive, competitive will become more apparent over time. Um, so Kenya is able to export within ESC, partly because there's not as much competition, but comp uh, manufacturing exports as a share of total uh, exports, they're actually combined within ESC and Comesa area, partly because of proximity. So in a way, it also suggests that we have a regional advantage based on distance. <coughs> um, but our efficiency is not growing so fast that we can actually expand it beyond. But basically, yes, Kenya's manufacturing has a regional advantage. Now, does, the, that, does that mean the change in Kenya's PPP per capita against Brazil over the years <coughs> is most likely explained by price level PPP conversion? It could be that as well. Um, uh, but with India, I actually think India's ability to export, obviously one of the things that exports do is growth has been higher. And if you know, um, India has had high growth rates as well since its uh, since its um, since liberalisation began in the mid 90s, um, and while Kenya has been growing at between three percent to five percent on an average basis, fluctuating around that band, India has been growing actually at about seven percent and has maintained it for a while. So that also reflects differences in uh, in the overall growth rates, which obviously also reflect some um, um, increased productivity growth. Uh, Alan, what is manufacturing losing out to? Um, I think it's manufacturing is actually losing out to agriculture. It's not to digital economy. The digital economy in Kenya is not large, Alan. <laughs> I think Kenyans need to get really, really clear. The digital economy is not large. Uh, the digital economy, I will say, is unlikely to be the growth factor for Kenya for two reasons. Why? The digital economy in Kenya is very, very small. Two, it employs a very small number of people. A very, very small number of people. So consider Safaricom, which is on the frontiers of digital economy or banks, all of them together employ less than um, 100,000 people. Uh, so Safaricom 
an extremely productive farm, one of the most productive in East and Central Africa, has 6,000 employees, 6,000. I mean, you can't even fit them all in a stadium. So the digital economy has its advantages. It actually can help with other sectors for their growth, but don't lie to yourselves that the digital economy will, will uh, supplant Kenya's manufacturing sector or that the digital economy will sink that many jobs. Considering as fast, the digital economy tends to employ many more people in higher tertiary level education. So I think we need to have the, the right perspective about what the capabilities of the digital economy is. For a country with a level of productivity growth, it can raise productivity, but at the same time, I think we have some little waiting to do, and the digital economy will have to be embedded into other sectors. So digital sectors require very high capital, but they employ very high, very few people. They're very highly productive, but it's not going to employ the 600,000 shillings people who leave I mean, who leave uh, high schools every year, not for the time being, because that's not the structure of the economy yet. Uh, data from the informal sector, I think this is also Alan's question. Uh, how likely is it that the informal sector really adequately cover? Look, uh, if you look at uh, the National Bureau of Statistics, I think because you're asking us about the methodology, the methodology of the National uh, Bureau of Statistics and Kenya's entry into, in 2012, in 2014, uh, when Kenya, when Kenya's income level went to, I mean, rather when Kenya became a middle income country, uh, part of the reason for that was that actually Kenya aggregated the contributions of the informal sector. So the argument that the informal sector is not measured anymore died in 2011 because that's already been captured and the national aggregate statistics captures all those sectors. And that's why it's able to tell you that last year for every 10 jobs that were created in the economy, nine of them came from the informal sector, what is called the informal sector. So there's very good measurement so far. I think Kenya has one of the, uh, the better ones even on this continent based on the contributions of the informal sector. So the idea that the informal sector is not covered anymore in national statistics is not, is not true. Um, are there errors? Probably because all measurements have errors, but under reporting is not as large as we would like to say. Uh, then um, Eri, uh, from, so she asked, from your discussions, it seems external competition will constrict local production due to price differentials. In your opinion, do you think the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya policy is out of place? So those are two questions. Let me ask you the first one. The first one is, let's talk about Kenya's manufacturing. And we referred to this World Bank production, which was basically to measure production levels across farms. And we found out two things. One is that manufacturing in Kenya has big dispersion. In other words, it has farms that are extremely efficient that can compete globally and other farms that are very, very inefficient, but they are protected by distortions in the country in the sense that government allows them to continue to operate even if they're inefficient. And I think I can tell, they have not had, the, the, the study does not tell, but I can tell you which ones these are. Some of those farms are like our, the sugar farms in Kenya. I hate to say our, the sugar farms in Kenya, completely inefficient. Um, and whatever it is that makes Kenyans want to continue to support them, that's fine. Whatever it is that Kenyans, they cannot compete globally. The only reason they survive is that Kenya has laws which limit import of sugar. So we exhaust Kenyan sugar first before we can import excess. What that does is it means that even for our income growth, our ability to afford products is lower. That's the first one. So at the household level, the first thing it does is it makes your life expensive. The second thing it does is that it means that your, uh, the total factor productivity in Kenya is reduced by virtue of the fact that some very big farms are completely inefficient, but they continue to survive and they continue to run. It makes the overall economy inefficient. Those are the choices we are making. It does not mean that if we constrict competition, those farms will get better. These farms have been protected for 40 years, 40 years. The people in the IEA who were not born when some of these farms the protection started. I hope they don't retire with some of these farms still existing. What it tells you from basic economics is that for productivity to improve, some of these farms would have to die. And by dying, I'm not meaning that they should be destroyed. It means we are wasting capital and wasting labor. That labor and capital should be diverted to more efficient production so that overall productivity, labor, and use of total factors actually increases. So it does not mean that external uh, competition is a bad thing. 
it means that it is possible for those firms to establish a new foundation to raise the level of productivity in the country. Their existence is dragging everybody down. Now, in your opinion, do you think the Buy Kenya Build Kenya policy is out of place? The Buy Kenya Build Kenya policy is sensible. But it is only sensible if you're saying that we are helping to buy Kenyan products if there's a choice of also competing products coming in. It will not be helpful if you say that we are going to buy Kenyan products even if they cost five times as much. So I will tell you, for instance, I like to use the word of a bed because it was most salient as we were preparing this. There are two Kenyan carpenters. One I think is in Nairobi, the other was in Campbell County. And both of them want to sell hospital beds to hospitals in Kenya today, which is fine. They claim those are hospital beds. They are not ISO certified or not been certified, but they look decent. Maybe they qualify or not. But the point is this, their competitors in China are able to sell manual beds at 5,000 and electric, electric, which would be adjusted at $120. So 5,000 to 12,000. So even if you buy an electric, electric bed where you can adjust and the patient can adjust for themselves, everything for themselves, you're buying five times more outside than you're buying domestically. That is not competitive. So if you're buying Kenya to build Kenya, by buying that bed, you're not building Kenya. You're building a simple entrepreneur who will be so inefficient that they'll not be able to compete, but they'll get tenders for government to buy 600, 500 beds. Remember, from the price effect, if we went for the most competitive bed price, it means instead of buying 6, bed, 600 beds, 500 beds that government is prepared to buy from that carpenter in Kenya, we'd be able to buy 3,000. 3, so that comparison alone tells me that you cannot use Buy Kenya, Build Kenya policy blindly. It will not build Kenya. It will trap the country in lower productivity. And it pays over the long term. Are there Kenyan firms that are able to compete? There are. And my view is if I was the president or if I was the people doing the procurement, I would tell them, this is what the Chinese can provide for us at 5,000. If you match this, even for just a premium of 10%, then we are able to buy from you because you can provide them easier. And you can also, uh, you are also able to provide volumes because for the Chinese ones, you can actually afford. You can buy a limited of one and you can buy a thousand. All of them will come at the same time. So that's what worries me. So the buy Kenya, build Kenya thing, we need to look at it in a more progressive way. Should we buy Kenyan products? Certainly, but they must meet benchmarks that are acceptable. If you're buying one at five times the price of the other and it is not certified globally, I think you're probably wasting public resources. Final co comment to Shelmi. You're asking uh, government policy on proportion of local content. Since 40% of all government should be from all local sources, I can tell you it's two things. We have manufacturing farms and service farms that can provide internationally benchmarked quality. If those are the ones you're building, it's a good thing because when you build them, they actually will be able to do two things. They'll absorb the other farms and make them themselves bigger and employ that labor, or those other farms that cannot compete will die or will collapse, and then they will use those resources for other things. So it's not a loss in the chapter. What we are trying to say is that government expenditure should be efficient. And by making government expenditure efficient, even Kenya's private sector will follow that lead. I don't think that any Kenyan hospital today that will buy those beds that we have been talking about and which we as Kenyans, have, some Kenyans have been praising. Why? Because if you have a hospital in Nairobi, which needs an ICU bed, and ICU services are expensive, they are not going to start by buying a product which is a fixed cost that is five times higher than what they can find by simply ordering it online from China. So that's the point that we're trying to say. So we, we think that there's a place for all of us to actually use government procurement to raise the quality and the total factor, I mean, factor productivity, raise productivity in Kenya. But buying expensive goods just because they are Kenyan and because it looks shiny is not the way to do it. And this World Bank study actually shows that for Kenya to break and actually start to, for manufacturing sector to grow, more efficiency would have to be accepted. Thanks. Thanks, John. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Kwame and uh, and uh, Leo. Um, so we'll go to a second round of of uh, questions. Um, and again, I will just go to the chat box. Mm -hmm. um, 
So there's an appreciation, of course, we've had, uh, I, could, I, I can see a couple of uh, people appreciating the insights and uh, from, from the presentations and the discussions. Um, and there's a comment from Linda, thanks for this great presentation. I had not considered the flow in the recent Duakali sector products and how it impacts on us when we want to compete globally, which is where we should be headed. Thanks, uh, Linda. Then from Duncan, um, so something related to where we should go with these uh, studies um, uh, and basically our policy engagement uh, with this with these kind of insights and studies. So what he says here is that um, um, the question is where does this or many other um, the question is where does this end? At what point is the government brought on board? So maybe Kwame, you can weigh in on that. Um, another one from Linda. Um, so what Linda is saying is asking is the relationship between education and the and the country's GDP, health, trade is also a good one. So that if we do not want to spend in education, we we impact our future terms our future terms of our ability to trade competitively. Spending in education is actually a win and not a loss. That's we should that's that's it should be prioritized. Um, from Shell Me. Uh, so Shell Me would also like a comment on whether whether we've done any analysis of manufacturing after the big four agenda since it's after the big four agenda since its contribution to GDP is expected is expected to go up. So again, Kwame, Kwame or Kembo, you can respond to that. Then a direct one to Kwame from uh, Abdi Rahman. So Abdi Rahman would like you Kwame to comment on the impact of ICT investment over the years in view of the highlighted performance of the manufacturing sector and what this portends with respect to regional competitiveness. Mm. Again, from Abdi Rahman. Sorry, where is it? Have I lost it? Mm. Uh, so what he's asking is, what are the implications of graduation to lower or graduating to lower middle income status in terms of capital markets dynamics and access to finance and any possible risks and perhaps lessons that can be drawn in similar graduation in other region in other regions yeah so i think that's it from the chat box um so again let me invite uh, kemboy kemboy you can weigh in on any of those questions and then Kwame. And, and also make your parting shot or final remarks, and then Kwame, you can respond to whatever questions, uh, to the remaining questions, and also make your final re remarks. So, Kemboy? Okay, John. So, uh, Abdirahman, finally, what are the implications of graduation to, to, to low-income to low, low status and in terms of cap capital dynamics and any possible risks and lessons. So, if you look at what Kwame explained in the in in the in the about the domestic factors, especially about the efficiency of government in in terms of size, redistribution, and also, so one of the things is that government must be efficient. It does not matter. So. A deliberate, a deliberate question, a deliberate policy direction has to be undertaken to to deal with that, and also the issue of competition and the and the market problems that we have. So you all remember that for that some private equity firms have been very interested in, for example, in investing in Kenya, because you spoke about the issue of capital dynamic capital market dynamics. They've been very interested, but when they come to Kenya. They are looking for investments uh, for markets where they can put 
millions of dollars. People are looking in ventures to invest like two hundred million dollars. So, but they couldn't find, and that's why, as you all noted, that uh, you must have noted that they put money in places like education. Those are the only places they could find. So we have to, uh, we have to allow regulation and competition to work, and we have to value the question of efficiency so that we are able to, to, to compete. Uh, and I wanted to say something in, in, in finally about what, the, uh, from that, the World Bank study that we quoted and where they compared leaders versus laggards. One of the things that they noted is that even if productivity enhancing policies were, were put across by the policymakers, it was unlikely to impact significantly those firms that come identify them as laggard firms. Another thing is that they said, even if you are put up export promotion policies, and by, by export promotion policies, we mean that reducing the fixed, fixed cost of exporting, it might not have impact on those laggard firms. So another thing is they said, that policies to improve Lakat farms' productivity altogether will be inefficient. So those three things is that un unless we are able to open up for competition, unless we are able to open up for competitions, and our local farms are able to, to, to compete, just like, for example, like in textiles, they are able to compete like with Turkish farms or Chinese farms. There is nowhere that there is nowhere the Kenyan the Kenyan Nini the Ken the we are going that structural transformation is going to occur and uh, the economy is going to progress because some of the farms like for example South Africa if you, if you could see I remember one of the things that we had come and mentioned in one of the forums is that South Africa if you look at their export export there is no sector that is above 17 percent. So their their export, their, 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 some of the things they export are widely spread from vehicles, like for example the Mercedes Benz, all the way to to, to minerals, and that is improving productivity. So if we are able to match up productivity to even some local examples like some examples like Malaysia or South Africa will go far. So that is my conclusion. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Kemboi. Uh, Kwame? Okay, uh, I'll start with the question by Shelmith. Yes, Shelmith, uh, uh, I think about two years ago we wrote an, um, a piece. We actually published part of it in the, the East African about what it would take for 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 manufacturing to grow out of the big four, an analysis of the big four and specifically manufacturing, what did it take to grow manufacturing from seven percent, which is what it was, to fifteen percent? Originally twenty percent and also to fifteen percent. So we drew some scenarios. If you're interested in that, please send us your email. We'll send you a copy of it uh, for your for your, for your record. But yes, uh, our view is that. Uh, what economists call structural transformation, which is basically to inform the structure of an economy. And what that means is that right now, for every 100 shillings of GDP, 31 comes from agriculture, uh, 7 comes from manufacturing, uh, another 9 comes from manufacturing, so that's 40, and then 60 comes from uh, agriculture, uh, I mean, sorry, 33 comes from agriculture, 7% uh, comes from manufacturing, 9% comes from manufacturing, and then the rest from ad additional other services. So. The path that most countries have taken historically is to make sure that you're moving people from agriculture into other services where higher productivity and higher incomes come from and are more sustainable. So you take them into manufacturing and then over time into higher level services. And that's happening, except the manufacturing sector in Kenya over the last 20 years has actually shrunk as opposed to growing. So what we needed to do is to actually expand it. And so we said, what would that mean even for incomes? And it's an impressive thing about what it would mean. because. Even with manufacturing, notwithstanding the fact that some farms are very inefficient, manufacturing in Kenya still has farms that actually pay very high wages uh, relative to being a, a small-scale farmer or a subsistence farmer. So it has a lot of scope for growth, for exports, for income growth, and also for productivity, as we mentioned. 
So that brief is available and you might have to do. Uh, to Omar Duncan, Duncan has asked us as well what we will do about uh, uh, with this through a government brief. We try to actually provide briefs and send to, to government what these ideas are. The one on manufacturing we already did. This one on uh, buy Kenya, build Kenya, we haven't done a proper analysis because part of it is sensible, but there's a big part of uh, buy Kenya, build Kenya that is risky because it could trap Kenya, continue to tra trap the country in low level manufacturing uh, or farms, actually just a few farms completely settled and which continue to, to absorb a lot of uh, resources without necessarily contributing to, create, uh, to, to productivity growth, which is a big problem for Kenya. Growth alone, GDP growth is not a problem because GDP growth is comprised of many things. But as John mentioned at the beginning, what we want is jobs, job growth that creates jobs, and then that, as people say, are seen through through better welfare for many people as opposed to just a few. So I think that's, um, that's an imperative. So we send that, we'll do this study. We are writing an opinion article about the present, about, about, I mean, about this ad argument about, uh, about, um, about hospital beds. And our view is that if you consider it in terms of economics, the argument shouldn't be whether the president is favoring somebody who is a political friend or not, or whether another part, this should be split among Kenyans. The argument should be, are we buying value for money? And both of those do not provide value for money so far. Uh, so that's basically, so you prepare, you'll see it in the popular press in a couple of weeks. I mean, in a couple of days, and it'll also be available as a blog post on our website. Um, now, Joanna has asked a question is how is Juakali regulated? Uh, you know, Juakali has a couple of many associations. And I think that's one of the things that those associations should do, in my view, is actually ensure that they do standards. Now, one of the things, as you all know today, uh, the government of the U.S. has closed the consulate uh, that the Chinese government had in, in Houston, right, in Texas. And part of their view is that some of these were actually being used. That's a claim. I don't. I, 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 there's no evidence so far. But the claim is that the Chinese have been stealing ideas from American farms. It's a claim. Uh, and therefore, they think that that is creating unnecessary competition or uh, unfair competition. Now, if I was to be a member of a Jokali association in Kenya today, or if, I wanted to, if the government wanted to help them, the government should tell them that, look, globally, this is what a bed looks like. Uh, there's a manual bed which you can adjust manually, which a nurse would have to do, and there's an electric one. And what you'll tell them is, can you match this bed in these numbers at this price we will buy? If you cannot match this bed, then you make components of it. Because the way most manufacturing countries have developed, Vietnam, even China, all these countries, they started by, if you cannot make the whole bed competitively, you make a portion of it in such a way that you can match the global standard. Then you get into a global value chain where all you do is provide that component. Your Kali advisors in Kenya, your Kali producers in Kenya, mostly, they make fancy things that are really good when you look at it. But the most important thing is if your price is not competitive, it means your productivity is not right. It means either you are getting very huge profits or you are not able to scale because your facility is not making productive, I mean, uh, the most competitive use of resources. So if I was a Kenyan, I'm investing in a hospital, or even if I was a governor, and I wanted to buy for hospitals in Siaya to double the number of, of beds in Siaya, and a bed in Kenya cost 45,000 or 68,000, as I saw some of them quoted in the press, and the same bed is available from, from China at 15,000 shillings. It would be completely completely irresponsible in the use of public money to buy one bed when you can buy five so that you can raise from raising the number of hospital beds from eight as China as, as CIA has I could raise it to 40 but all I'm going to do is just raise it to eight because I want to buy locally that is a responsible use of public money and it can actually cost lives because it means when those beds are needed you will have insufficient capacity that is the argument we are making at the IEA so the Juakali sector is extremely creative. We must ask them to continue to provide, we must provide them with competition and the incentive to provide goods and services that can be bought and bought over the long term. So it's an information and a learning journey. So those standards should exist. And my view would have been, if that Juakali guy said, that look, I have this bed here, it meets the same standards, the same quality standards, and I'm, I'm giving it to you for less than what you'd find on China, or just 10% because here you don't have to wait and I can supply 100 every week for the rest of the year. That is what production is. 
if we are encouraging people to produce on the basis of a on low cost, I mean of high cost, uh, then we are making them inefficient, but using public money irresponsibly as well. That is not sustainable. So batching conformity to those standards is one of the things that those Jokali associ associations should actually start to do. Look at a bed in China and ask ourselves, how have they made this? What are the costs for each component part and how do we compete? And that's the way to do it. Even if it means allowing governments to allow them to import some of the components so that you can put together a sampler component that is still competitive by adding value to some certain things, that's it. But having a bed that's 68,000 shillings and we can find it in China for 15,000 is not good use of money. But even if government bought it, it would not be sustainable because not many other people would be able to service that cost over time. Abdul Rahman, yes. You see, the nature of the ICT sector is the ICT sector tends to, it's just like finance and all those other services, very high quality services, high level services. They tend to be very, very, they require very high levels of education. Uh, the productivity is very high, and because those jobs are automated, they're very easy to automate. So if you if you have together, for instance, an automatic automatic teller machine, which is an ATM machine, for instance, you can serve maybe 50 times more people than a teller can serve, and you can do many more things than it it does. So those jobs tend to be at tertiary level, and even those who do them tend to earn high income because they're very highly productive, but they are also not available for mass. So you cannot have one million tellers uh, in Kenya because of the number of banks that we have and also because banks tend to be capital intensive as opposed to labor intensive. We need labor intensive jobs which are high quality as well and or rather high productivity as well. And that's why manufacturing tends to be very easy to do because it's you can still replace. Uh, it's still not possible to replace every manufacturing farm with robots. But even if you do, there's a component and part of the value chains that would have to be undertaken, I mean, would have to be taken over by, by, by people who can do high quality job. They can design, they can design parts, they can complete parts, they can assemble them and make sure that they transport them and uh, make them competitive all around. So I think that's, uh, that's all we've, uh, um, that's, that's, that's all, John. Uh, as I conclude, uh, competition is essential and anything that involves uh, submitting or rather um, suspending competition in the name of buying locally uh, should be treated suspiciously because what it does is the evidence already shows that we are a high cost country in terms of the things that we uh, produce. Some of them are extremely good and that's the why they study by, uh, by, you should all look for it, it's a fantastic study. It's telling you that you have farms that compete but the only reason they compete is because they're competing globally and they're matching those global standards for their peers. And then you have some that are in Kenya, they cannot compete, but they are continuing to survive because of distortions and because they are protected and because they raise prices for everybody. So if we want the welfare to take place and that gap, the convergence to take place between Kenya and other countries who are our peers, it's clear we are going to have to release businesses to more competition. Businesses that are not efficient will have to change or even be transformed into new businesses. But having a high cost foundation of businesses that are not competitive, but being Kenyans being forced to buy those products will not be useful. And that's the reason we think that buy Kenya, build Kenya is a good slogan, but it must be supported by competition being available at all levels to raise productivity for all farms. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Kwame and Kemboy, um, for, for those uh, wonderful insights. Um, We've, we've indeed learned a lot, and I, I mean, I can already see from the chat box, people have really appreciated uh, uh, the dif different um, uh, gems here and there that they picked from the, the discussions. Um, uh, so um, I would like to actually request the participants to help me appreciate both Kwame and, uh, and Leo from wherever you are, just uh, give them a... John. John, yes. can I tell uh, There's Fanon Kihu. I think he has his hands up. I don't know whether he'd like to ask a question. You could allow him to ask the question if it's there, uh, and then we, we just close with everything else. Oh. There's somebody who has oh. his hands up. Fanon Kihu, I think he's a guest. Maybe you can ask him. To yeah, Fanon, ask. I'd actually requested him to yeah. to post his uh, question, but it's okay. So, Fanon. And I had posted, and I had posted one. Okay, so, so go ahead then. Yeah, so uh, my question is when you look at uh, our agriculture, 
and the processing um, uh, industry. We, we almost export, we export uh, a lot of raw materials and you look at tea, uh, coffee. Do you, do you think that value addition of these products will help uh, churn so that we do value addition before we actually export? Will that help maybe spur our economy further? Then the other thing is, should we empower our SMEs to actually do business at a global scale? In the sense that, in the example you had given, Kwame had given, you know, should we focus on buying hospital beds from China at a lower cost, or should we ask what China is doing to afford to sell its bed at that low, so that we tailor our SMEs now towards achieving the same and better? So I'm also thinking about uh, uh, when when you buy from China, you know, the money revolves around the economy of China. So it means that we're actually uh, using our taxpayers' money and taking it to China. But as opposed to, for example, when you buy this bed from a trader, when you buy something from a trader, you know the money circulates within the economy. So I think there are so many benefits which are spared in terms of when you buy from the trader, the trader will go and pay school fees. The, the, he's right here in the country. The, the, the matatu, uh, the, 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 the school, the, 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 after school fees is paid, the teacher will buy food. So there's a lot of circulation of uh, money when you spend locally. Should, should we actually uh, ignore this and just talk about uh, importing from where the prices are low, you know? So those are some of the, that, those are the questions I had. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fanon. Um, so I guess, Kwame, yeah, you can. Yes, so let me answer another. that. Yeah, yeah, you can Fan respond to that, Kwame. Fanon, Fanon. Um, look, competition in markets is a given. Um, um, so the idea, I, I think we should give you something to read on economics because the idea that uh, that money only circulates if you buy uh, domestically is not true. Uh, if we had that argument that, look, if we buy a product locally, even if it's expensive, then what it means is that we are circulating the money locally is the way we did it, then Germans will say, why should we buy Kenyan tea and coffee, even if they're the best ones? Why shouldn't that money circulate here? So that, that it, 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 it's a, I think I, I see, I hear people say it, it's a very bad argument, I have to say for an economist, for these two reasons. One, if you buy a hospital bed from India, from um, China, and China is not the only place, let's say even you buy a hospital bed from Tanzania, I mean from uh, China, if you're running a hospital for which people are paying, it means your costs are lower than somebody else who's bought a hospital, a bed at 68, because you have to pay for that bed as a fixed cost. So what that means is you're also able to provide efficient services. Remember what the function of this discussion is that Kenya's productivity is not growing, it's been flat. We need to grow it. And part of that, what that means is your input versus your outputs must be measurable in a way that shows that your input is. Now, if you are spending 68,000 shillings, to buy a bed that is available in China for 15,000 shillings, you are destroying value. You are destroying 43,000 shillings. So I think you uh, uh, be very careful when you make an argument like that in a, in a policy space because it's misinforming. So what I mean for, it, for instance is this. The reason Kenya is the best exporter of flowers is because our costs and we are the most efficient people in terms of producing carnations and roses so that they can get from Naivasha placed on a, on a cold storage van, brought to the airport, and sent all the way to Amsterdam, all within nine hours after the flowers were picked. That's what efficiency is. We shouldn't say that if somebody else will pick it in 18 hours, let's just buy it because we are buying local. Uh, we've been buying local sugar for 60 years. Those farms are not competing. Yesterday, two weeks ago, 52 billion shillings is being wiped out of their debt. So this idea that if money circulates locally, it's, it means that the economy is growing is not how economies work, unfortunately. It's a popular view, but it's not how economies work. That's one. Two, that's why we mentioned that the Kenyan multiple, um, there's a cost to buying something at an expense because resources are scarce. So if you're buying a bed at 68, which we could buy at 15, what means is if you have every other factor constant, it means you're where, rather than buying four beds, rather than buying five other beds, which would have allowed you to provide services to more people, a county like Sierra that has only nine beds, 
for every additional bed that it buys domestically, it would have bought another five beds. That cannot be efficient use of public money. However, as a private person, Fennon, if you've decided that I will always support private business, local businesses, irrespective of what happens, you can buy. You can decide by saying, I will always buy local, provided you are spending your own local money. But at the public level, buying expensive goods in the name of local industry is good politics, but it's very bad economics. Uh, and obviously, it leads to the inefficiencies doubling up. Because if your costs are already high, it means hospital costs will be higher in Kenya. It means uh, uh, the hospital costs to begin with will be buying in Kenya. And it also means that efficient businesses, inefficient businesses are kept in business while efficient ones are actually uh, uh, kept out because they're more efficient businesses, uh, inefficient ones are the ones that are doing business. So that's not true. So again, when you change money by sending money to, to, to China to buy a bed or to Tanzania to buy maize and to bring it in Kenya, the maize that you've brought has value because people don't eat money. People <laughs> use goods and services to provide other goods. So that bed is being used to create further value, which will raise productivity, as opposed to seeing this thing that money circulates. It's a bad idea, and um, I hope uh, we, can allow, we, we shouldn't allow it to actually uh, persist. So John, I think I've answered all the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, again, thanks, thanks a lot to Kwame and uh, Kwame and, uh, and, and, and Kemboi. Um, um it's now and i think they've done a good job in responding to virtually all the questions um uh, and it's now what uh, it's almost it's just a few minutes to to one uh so of course kwame you cannot there are some people have have shared their email addresses so you can you can you can send the the manufacturer in peace yes. to them this, the study that we did on 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 um on the manufacturing sector as part of the big four agenda. Um, you can share that with them. Otherwise, again, thanks a lot, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, gentlemen for spending your two, three hours uh, and sharing uh, and making comments uh, um, in, this, uh, in this webinar. Uh, just to remind you that uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs is actually a membership organization. Um, so please get in touch with our, you can actually visit our website. Uh, we have a, a menu there on, on, um, on uh, membership and we have forms that you can download online and, and send them back to our communication team. Or if you have any questions, you can either post it on the website or get in touch with our communication uh, officer, Oscar, if, um, for, for, any, for any questions. So you're invited to be, um, to be a member of the, the IEA uh, and through membership, of course, we share lots of, um, I mean, updates on all the things that we do and we share um, our our studies and our research and also engage you from time to time as, as, a, as a member. Uh, then secondly, um, please look out again for um, for such webinars, we, we, we will have one that's coming up soon, I guess, in the, the first week of, um, of August on, uh, on uh, universal health coverage, looking at the effects of, of, of COVID on, on, on that, uh, and many more. All this will be posted on our website and, and in our social media pages, so please interact with that and just to get an update of what's, what's coming coming up soon, yeah. So thanks a lot, and of course, let this conversation continue in our social media pages. Thank you, and have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye, John. Thank you very much. Bye.